Good morning, everyone. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, welcome uh, me, Karthik Guja, Associate Director for the Endovascular Program at Mount Sinai. Welcome you for our first monthly live, live webcast for the endovascular live cases of 2018. Hopefully, uh, we are looking forward for a great year. Um, and here today, we have a great case from Dr. Krishnan and his team. Uh, we welcome you, um, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you guys at the um, Endovascular Symposium uh, with Link this year. Uh, without further delay, uh, we'll go to um, the cath lab. Dr. Krishnan, good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you, Karthik? And uh, we want to wish everybody a very happy new year from, uh, from Mount Sinai to all of you out there. Uh, we've got a very exciting new year ahead of us. Um, and I uh, want to just uh, reiterate what Dr. Gujo was telling everyone. Um, you know, we, we're, we're transmitting a live case to uh, Link uh, next week. And uh, we'll be um, also, obviously, um, looking forward to meeting all of you at the symposium on uh, June 12th, 13th, and 14th at, here at Mount Sinai. Um, the, the Mount Sinai Fellows, Endovascular Fellows course is on the 12th, I believe, right, Liz? Can you just look that up? And then on the 13th, is, uh, which is that Tuesday, is uh, Link Mount Sinai Day 1, and 14th is Link Mount Sinai Day 2. So obviously this year we just had a little, um, I guess, update to everyone who's going to be watching is, uh, you know, we're really calling it the Complex Aortic and, and Vascular Symposium because the whole focus is going to be on complex cases. Uh, rather than have two independent rooms, we're going to have a, a single room uh, with, an a with a vascular session followed by an aortic session day one and then an aortic session followed by a vascular session day two. So we're also going to have a complex breakout how-to uh, area in the tent, which is going to be very close by, uh, where, where, you'll, where there'll be one case performed over three or four hours during which uh, we'll go step by step to really help, uh, you know, uh, the, the interaction with the audience so they can learn how to approach these very, very complex cases and collaborate with us in doing those cases. Um, and finally, as far as the fellows course is concerned, under both you and uh, Vishal, uh, and now Dr. Bhaskar Prashotam is another co-director, uh, we've basically been decided to go ahead and, and really expand the agenda, but really focus on the cases again. And we're probably going to cut out a lot of the didactics and really create more interaction is what, what we've been thinking. So the, the website, uh, Link Mount Sinai, is up and running. The agendas will be online very, very soon. Uh, the e-blast will be going out, very, you know, as we speak, and then and then we hope to see you here uh, as soon as um, in in June, as well as when in during our live transmissions. Another exciting news is that we've been asked to transmit live to Arch uh, for the fourth straight year, uh, which is the the uh, uh, in uh, out of St. Louis. Dr. Jazz, uh, Jaswinder Singh and Dr. George Krasan have been kind enough to invite us, and we're excited again to present a nice uh, live case there as well. <coughs> So uh, enough of the updates. Uh, as you know, our team in the lab, uh, I don't have to tell Dr. Guja, Dr. Vishal Kapoor, who's the director of endovascular at um, uh, Mount Sinai St. Luke's um, and has been with us for since the beginning with these live cases. We've got uh, Dr. Sandeep Singla, who's our endovascular fellow. We've got Ray Lascano, who's our endovascular NP. And we've got uh, Liz, our, our, our uh, endovascular nurse. And, and uh, Marichu is on vacation today. So, so we, we're ready to start. So, Car without further ado, you want to go ahead, uh, Sandeep, and present the case? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's go to the slides. Uh, good morning, everybody. So we have an 81-year-old uh, male with a history of uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, known coronary artery disease, known peripheral artery disease, and uh, CKD. His creatinine is uh, 1.7 today. Uh, he presented to us initially with a three-month history of claudication uh, with a half block and uh, left more than right, Rutherford category three. Next. Yeah. On exam, he had a Doppler uh, left DP and uh, PT, and ABIs uh, were decreased on the left at 0 0.77, and the right ABI was 0 0.89. I, uh, I didn't make a note of the, we did a duplex, and the velocity over the common femoral area on the left was uh, 333 with a, uh, a ratio of uh, 3.2, which is pretty significant. His uh, labs, uh, hemoglobin of 13.1, platelets 183, uh, INR of 1.0. This creat of 1.4 was about mm -hmm. a week ago, and today it's 1.7. We initially tried, uh, he was already on aspirin, Plavix, and a statin, and we gave him a trial of celostazole, which essentially failed on him. He didn't notice any benefit with that. Next. So these are the pictures which we took uh, about three weeks ago while doing uh, working on his uh, right leg. 
Uh, this is the end flow. You can see no significant tortuosity, some calcium in the common iliac and external iliac on both sides. Next. Uh, this is a runoff on the left leg and uh, diffuse, uh, two vessel runoff with the diffuse disease in uh, both AT and PT. And I know if you can appreciate, there's a chunk of calcium right in the common femoral area. Next. This is a DSA, which kind of gives a more appreciation of the heavy calcium in the common femoral area. Want to stop here? Great. Okay. So, um, you know, so this, this case, I think, highlights a lot of the issues that we face. I think two things right off the bat for the audience uh, that, that, that I think Vishal and I were talking about earlier was that the AVIs, you know, with this level of uh, calcification and disease should be a little bit lower because if I'm not wrong, it involves both the, it's proximal to the profunda. So we went ahead and did some angiograms. Can you uh, uh, show the angiograms, Rashal, and just go over the angiograms? So again, this is our access site. Well, we, uh, Sandeep showed you the inflow of the iliacs, which was pretty much non-significant. So just looking at the dry uh, cine, you can see the degree of calcification in the common femoral artery extending somewhat into the SFE and a little bit into the profunda as well. So we took some orthogonal view. Again, you can see it right on the femoral head, the calcification sitting right up there. The rest of the uh, SFA, whatever in the picture, is not that remarkable. So it's all confined to the CFA region. Uh, a few DSA shots, uh, you're going to see, again, again, you can see the calcification and the haziness, which is depicted on the angiogram. And the profunda ostium and the SFA ostium are pretty much non-significantly involved in this case. So and another orthogonal view right here for you, just to appreciate how the profunda and the other branches <coughs> are coming out. <coughs> And going down, just doing a quick runoff, the, like I said before, the SFA is pretty much uh, non-obstructive, some lump uh, disease in the mid-SFA. And like Sandeep said, there's significant <laughs> below the knee disease involving all the three vessels with the two vessel runoff. So I guess it's, you can essentially appreciate that the disease essentially rises in the CFA, and that's why we are going to talk today and present a case about how to manage these cases where the lesion is all in the CFA and the SFA is not much involved. Right. So, so I mean, I think for me at least, as uh, uh, having done this for a while, what's surprising is that the ABIs aren't lower, uh, but the velocities obviously are high because of the profunda involvement. One could be that he has severely calcified vessels and the 0.77 is a little artificially elevated, but, you know, the symptoms are there and the symptoms are, are quite uh, lifestyle limiting and he could not tolerate the platol. So, as far as the options for therapy, I mean, one of the things we need to talk about is uh, how would you guys, uh, first of all, let's, if this patient comes to your office, Dr. Guja, uh, what, 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 are the, what are the things that, that you, would, you would offer this gentleman, uh, knowing that you have this area of this lesion with this runoff and this anatomy, uh, if he came up to you and said, Dr. Guja, you know, what, what, what are the options for my therapy? I mean, assuming that he's failed medical therapy. Right, PK, so uh, a couple of years ago, I mean, if we were talking uh, two years before of what's happening now in endovascular world, we would say common from an artrectomy is probably a good option for him because it can be done on local anesthesia and it can be done and it's a very pre simple surgery, right? That's probably the best option for him, especially with this degree of calcification. Don't you agree? Oh, no, no, I, I think that that's part of the reason for having this discussion. Right. I think uh, without a question, um, I think the standard of care at today's day and age is common femoral and dartrectomy. Um, and uh, I know that uh, Sandeep has prepared some uh, data for, to show you guys. Because I think that, you know, the crux of this case is uh, partially technical, but it's a lot of discussion. No. Because as, uh, as I think we all start this, uh, you know, as endovascular is becoming more and more mainstream, and a lot more people are doing it who aren't necessarily uh, trained, like, trained in an official fellowship program. I think it's important to understand like what, what, what are the options that people have. You know, um, as interventional cardiologists, I mean, uh, you see a uh, calcium, you feel you can balloon stent it. Radiologists are phenomenal with, uh, with, uh, with all their different equipment and vascular surgeons obviously uh, understand the anatomy and know the data probably a little bit better than I see. So uh, the general IC I am talking, so the, the uh, non-trained IC I should say. So the issue here is to really understand that it's not a technical issue, although there are a lot of technical things that can go wrong, which we're going to go over, uh, but I think it's also understanding in terms of what is the benefit so, and what is the data. So I'm going to stop here and, and just wait, and uh, we've got the patient on, on uh, bivalve, I'm assuming, or heparin. Okay. Heparin, so we're going to watch the ACT closely, and we'll, and we'll talk about why we're, we're, we went with heparin when we <laughs> always go with bivalve. And, um, and I'm going to let Dr. Singler go ahead and present the data, and then we can talk. Sure. Slides? Well, you can okay. skip this one. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
So, you know, as Dr. Krishna and Dr. Gurja and Dr. Kapoor mentioned, you know, the essence of uh, CFA treatment is kind of, uh, you know, based on the premise that uh, endotrachmy is still the uh, standard of care. But before we delve more into data, you know, a couple of uh, highlights about the CFA anatomy. When making a decision about the uh, endovascular approach or, you know, endovascular treatment for CFA, three things need to be considered. Diameter, length, and bifurcation anatomy. Uh, next slide. So uh, diameter is important, uh, you know, in this case, especially because uh, when choosing therapy about balloon and what atherectomy to use, uh, it's important not to oversize or undersize because we want to avoid dissections and any f especially flow limiting dissection or perforations uh, because we want to avoid any stenting. And f uh, what we typically have is, you know, the mean diameter in uh, men and women, they range from anywhere from six to eight millimeter range. Next. Length of CFA is variable, but most of the CFAs we encounter are in the range of four to six centimeters. Uh, length, uh, next slide. Another important uh, consideration when doing endovascular treatment for CFA is the bifurcation of uh, the bifurcation angle between the uh, superficial femoral and the deep femoral. And uh, if you look at this is on the right side, and the lateral, uh, the one on the uh, top row, third one is the most common variant where the uh, profunda comes off as a lateral branch, but it's very important to make sure that we take angulated views to define this angle uh, when we are doing the ballooning and atherectomy in these cases. Next. So, you know, how do we, uh, there was a task two classification, the most, uh, you know, which is practiced, and uh, this is from 2007. And, you know, this uh, CFA lesions tend to be uh, less common, and so is their uh, reflection in the guidelines also. Uh, if you look at type C lesions, it's they kind of define CFA involvement in addition to external iliac artery. And type D lesion for CFA is a chronic total occlusion. But they really don't define that what is, let's say in our case, we have a 90% heavily calcified lesion, which category it would fall into. So I have to presume just by, you know, from it's what data we have, it would be at least a type C lesion. It's a type C because yeah, type you have C. heavily calcified unilateral yeah. and or yeah. CFA. That's it. <coughs> yeah. It's type C. Yeah, but doesn't say or CFA. You know, yeah. That's the thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Next. So, you know, what are the guidelines? You know, or what is the data which kind of supports between uh, endotrachmy and surgery? There's a Sky 2014 uh, paper which uh, the the way the language is that disease of the CSA ha has traditionally been treated with open surgery, which is still we kind of follow and accept uh, because of the longevity of the durability of the treatment. But they do say that, you know, endotrectomy may be considered in uh, patients who are poor surgical candidates. Next. Similar language reflected in 2016 AHA ACC PAD guidelines, where they say that, you know, favor a surgical revascularization in lesions involving common femoral artery. Next. So how does, you know, uh, where do these guidelines come from? You know, as... Uh, like uh, there are not large series. The most recent one or the, uh, th with a decent uh, number of uh, patients is one from 2011 from Dr. Cambria's group where they examined 68 patients and uh, they had a five-year patency in the range of about 90%. But what we need to acknowledge with endotrectomy is even though we call it like in you know, a simple surgery, even in best of the hands, they had 5% uh, major complication and about 10% minor complications, which actually in the minor, they include wound infections and the length of stay tends to be three to four days. As compared to endovascular, you know, we, are, we typically don't keep a patient more than 24 hours. Next. So this is their patency data, which is really good. You know, assisted patency at five years was close to 100% and uh, primary patency was in the range of 90%. Next. So, you know, if we have that good of a data for endotrectomy, then why do we talk about endovascular approach? Two things, you know, one, uh, endovascular uh, approach is more uh, kind of, you know, more uh, likable to the patient because the, it's, it's not a surgery. Patient does not have to stay long. Hospital admin people like it, you know, because of cost uh, benefit. And uh, there is upcoming data from large centers and uh, this uh, <coughs> approach. So this is uh, the largest series of patients still available, uh, 360 consecutive patients from Germany. Next. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 go back. So kind of a little uh, break up of the patient characteristics. Uh, they uh, examined a sequential 11,000 plus patients, and uh, they had 466 patients who underwent uh, 516 uh, CFA interventions. Now, uh, 
For this paper, they examined only interventions done for atherosclerotic disease, and they excluded all the CFA interventions done for any vessel injuries, iatrogenic, bleeding complications, or uh, vascular closure device related. And it's, uh, you know, the lesion characteristic kind of reflect what we in our all-comer base is. They had about 18% uh, total occlusions, 39% uh, were clo uh, bifurcation lesions. They had about 13% uh, were uh, post endotrectomy cases. Uh, next. Uh, you know, this is their data. So uh, essentially looking at it at five years as compared to endotrectomy, you are looking at a patency in the range of about 50, 60% which is pretty uh, you know, uh, sobering as compared to endotrectomy. Next. Looking at subgroups, you know, they, had, uh, they required stenting in 133 patients versus uh, 227 where it only PTA was done. And uh, the one-year patency, one once you stent is better as compared to non-stented. Next. Next slide, please. Another interesting fact which emerged from their data is that during the later years of this data collection, they started doing directional atherectomy, you know, which is reflected in their numbers. Uh, only 25 patients as compared to 335 which did not have atherectomy. And uh, interestingly, if you look at the patency at one, uh, the TLR at uh, one year, it was on less than 5% as compared to 20%, which is pretty reassuring. Next. Similar data from across the Atlantic from US, a uh, single center a study of 167 patients, they looked at they did uh, balloon angioplasty, atherectomy, and stenting when needed. And uh, next slide. On the same lines from the larger study, they also had uh, similar. In this case, they used a jet stream atherectomy. And uh, they had uh, better patency uh, with the atherectomy as compared to angioplasty. And uh, this is, they have data up to uh, almost, uh, uh, looking at it, five years, or uh, four years for uh, atherectomy. It's close in the range of 90%. Next. Um, uh, the most recent one, this is not a, uh, as uh, rigorous a data. This is more a vascular quality initiative, kind of, you know, all the centers, uh, they contribute data to this. And an interesting fact emerges from this. This is a study of about, this is a uh, 2017 paper of more than 1,000 plus patients who underwent uh, endovascular uh, revascularization for CFA. Next. And interestingly, you know, the out, the re, uh, re-intervention free survival or TLR is dependent on the indication. Nice, nice. So once you have a tissue loss, meaning Rutherford category five or six, your patency rates are lower as compared to when you do it, the same intervention for claudication versus rest pain. Next. Nice, nice. So what's the role of nitinol stents? One study from 2011 from France, they used uh, stents in 100% patients. And uh, next. They uh, did not have a comparative arm, and they showed a patency in the range of 90%. We'll, we'll go over this point again, you know, like wha what's the role of stenting in uh, CFA and when not and when to use it. Next. Uh, more recent data, you know, this is important to understand uh, that what is the role of covered stents. Uh, this is a series of 17 patients where they had to use the uh, Viaban stents, which are covered stents, uh, self-expanding, uh, for uh, uh, CFA lesions where there was no surgical option, high risk for just balloon angioplasty, or the, they were doing it under emergent conditions like vessel perforation or dissection uh, resulting from other procedures. Next. And interestingly, at two years, the primary assisted, patenc uh, as, uh, assisted patency was 100%, as, and uh, primary patency was even uh, uh, good uh, at 90% uh, plus. Next. So, you know, what we essentially follow is uh, or kind of a summary of, uh, you know, the data and uh, what we follow at Mount Sinai is that endotrectomy should be considered as the first line treatment of CFA disease. And, you know, in this case, we did consult the surgeons because of his age, patient preference and the multiple comorbidities. The patient opted for and uh, opted for endovascular approach. And that's why we kind of offered him that. Uh, with the upcoming data in the last five to seven years, uh, you know, endovascular treatment does provide viable options with durability not yeah. as good as endotrectomy in general. But when we give the benefit of atherectomy, we are hoping to prolong the durability of the procedure. Another thing which we're going to use in this case, there are I could not come across any published data is we're going to give him the benefit of drug-coated therapy, which in our belief, which we have used uh, in other cases before, it will prolong the durability of a procedure. We will. Uh, now, coming to the stents, you know, we use stents only and if we have a significant flow-limiting dissection, 
and we fail a prolonged balloon and if there is any re reason like a uh, perforation or, or uh, anything else going on. Uh, covered stents is it's only for board. emergencies and uh, you know we, we tend to avoid in general we tend to avoid stents because CFA is the most common site we need to access for any vascular procedures and uh, there are some case reports where access been, uh, has been obtained through the stents but they tend to be associated with significant bleeding groin complications. Okay. All right, excellent, yeah. excellent <laughs> overview. Uh, Vishal was commenting on how thorough that was as you were talking, so great job. Um, so Vishal, I mean, we, you know, the data is, 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 it seems to be very clear in terms of patency that uh, the surgical, um, you know, data out of Cambria, although no head-to-head -head data really exists, uh, the surgical data uh, from, from uh, Mass General or, or from the Massachusetts area is phenomenal. So, so in these kind of patients, what are your goals um, when obviously say this guy, as we know, has, been see, has seen our surgeons here, um, has been uh, discussed, had a long discussion with them, has decided uh, along with the surgeons that we're gonna give it an endo shot. Can you describe any anatomic characteristics um, that, that would say to you that, hey, you know what, this is gonna be a bad outcome with, uh, with endartrectomy, I mean with, uh, with the percutaneous approach and this guy should be a surgical candidate. Right, I mean, like uh, Sandeep presented, like endotrectomy from a, uh, from a trial perspective works on a very good level. But looking clinically or ang I guess angiographically, it's always concerned to see what's the degree of calcification and what's the involvement of the SFA and the profunda. For me, I mean, specifically for endovascular uh, people like us, we always have to appreciate the profunda and the SFA, especially the profunda because that's your lifeline to the leg. Let's say your patency rate, even though the data is excellent, let's say on, on this patient, he closes down his CFA or his SFA for whatever reasons, we always have to make sure the involvement of the profunda. Once we start involving the SFA and the profunda, I think it becomes technically very challenging to keep the patency or keep the lumens open for both the vessels. And in those cases, probably surgical options is the best because they can go and repair and reconstruct the profunda and do a plasty either into the profunda and the SFA depending on the lumen diameter. So for me, the involvement of the SFA and the profunda in addition to CFA is where it becomes complex. Pretty much like how we coronaries, we do the Medina, if you have a bifurcation lesion versus a focal lesion, it's a different treatment strategy. So in this case, we have more flexibility because it, it looks angiographically. I'm hoping uh, PK is gonna show us the IVAS and we'll define it, but angiographically, the SFA ostium and the profunda ostium look preserved. So we still have a wiggle room where we can manipulate and hopefully have better results. So I guess yeah. that's the biggest anatomical concern uh, with the treating CFA lesions so, per se. Uh, so PK, I know presentation was great, Sandeep. So um, do we have any data, Sandeep, on um, atherectomy and DCB? No, no. I did yeah. not come across even DCB. You know, uh, like I was looking for data for DCB in CFA territory, I could not. But I know we have done anecdotally some cases and uh, I haven't seen those cases back, so I presume we have good uh, results and we are uh, hoping to publish that. And then uh, atherectomy combined with DCB, definitely not in the CFA territory. Okay. So, so I think they presented one PK in TCT, I think, uh, a study for Italy. I think COPO's group, I think they presented one where they had 37 patients, I think retrospectively. I think they had uh, target level revas revascularization in two patients out of 30. Right. But, you know, I mean, listen, <laughs> the, the, the point I think that the audience needs to understand and, and um, I think it's very important to stress is what are the goals of therapy, right? So this is a claudicin. He's not going to lose his leg, right? So if you make this process worse with your endovascular therapy, you have done him an injustice. So, 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 so I think Vishal's point uh, to the audience, I mean, look, I mean, I'm an interventional cardiologist, but, you know, I think this is a totally separate field than interventional cardiology. So, you know, the Medina classification is a good correlate, but to, but to our, our, our radiology colleagues and our vascular surgery colleagues, it's a meaningless correlate. So I think that, you know, and, 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 and so therefore, I think that in this situation, <coughs> the, the answer has to be, is, is there a bifurcation involvement or not? And I think if there is a bifurcation involvement with the ostium of the profunda being involved, I think as an endovascular person, you should implore the patient to go to surgery. So this, this is just a body of the common femoral um, artery. So the idea here is, even though the stents, and this is very controversial here, as you and I know, and, and Vishal knows, you know, uh, you know, even though stents have done very well in the intermediate term uh, with Dr. Zeller's data, 
you know, in, in the North America, stents are very frowned upon here other than in serious bailout situations, perforations on, uh, you know, iatrogenic flow limiting dissections in term, uh, with, with complete shutdown of the leg um, in, uh, during coronary or other procedures. So <laughs> to do an elective stenting here is, is, uh, is, is not a good thing. Second, you don't want to make things worse by embolizing things downstream. So when we have calcified lesions, Generally, it's very hard to predict how uh, the, the, the vessel, uh, the, which way the, the calcium is going to go. So you have to choose one particular vessel to protect. Vishal and I have spoken about this multiple times. Generally, straight line flow is down the SFA, especially when you have non-obstructive disease. If the SFA is occluded, then we know the flow is going to go preferentially. In this case, the angle of takeoff of the profunda is, is more is acute. And clearly, the, for the calcium to go down would be quite unlucky for us into the profunda. I really think it would, it would preferentially go down the SFA. Second, the flow in the SFA is brisk. As you can see, they're almost filled pretty much the same. But if you look at the flow, uh, go show the runoff, please. I, if you look at the flow in the SFA as compared to the profunda and the runoff, and I think these subtle subtleties you have to start watching. See how the SFA goes much faster down than the profunda does. So the flow is, is preferentially going to go down the SFA. Now, there's no other way for, for you to know. I mean, you're not going to measure flow, flow hemodynamics with a wire or something like that. These are just little, little tidbits that you can take home uh, prior to doing it. But regardless, we always filter protect. And the filter is whatever filter you want to use or you're comfortable with or you have available, you can use. Now, Karthi, can you talk about uh, w what type of therapy and how you would approach this kind of lesion in terms of the choices of therapy that you have? Uh, in your armamentarium uh, in, in our lab here at Sinai. So, um, PK, as uh, you, me, and Vishal, we all three of you, almo all three of us almost use the same kind of equipment, but I think for this case, um, I think uh, probably it's, it's so calcified and it's eccentric. So, you can use a directional atherectomy here, uh, but with this degree of calcification, I don't know if directional atherectomy can do justice for this. Um, I think um, probably using a jet stream would probably be more reasonable especially with because of the vessel size and the degree of calcification. Again, as you said, we have to use a filter. Um, the other attractive devices we have um, is what? We have CSI. So I don't know if CSI would do justice in this because of the size of the common femoral. Um, I don't know if CSI would, uh, would do justice to this. But either directional atherectomy or jet stream would probably be a more reasonable option. I would probably choose, uh, if it were me, I would probably go with a jet stream. Uh, to give you more amount of uh, debulking uh, for the calcification. Um, and then I guess filter is used anyways. And then probably go with the DCB. But uh, Vishal, what do you think? No, I mean, again, like I said, uh, like Sandeep said, there's no real data on what kind of atherectomy supersedes one over the other. You could, you could use a jet stream, I mean, the jet stream pathway in this case and use a 2434 four burr and try to do it. The other option I would probably, probably just favor might be a directional atherectomy because uh, what I want to do is cause minimal damage to the CFA and have a little bit of control on my atherectomy device. So in this case, because it looks more eccentric to me rather than circumferential, uh, I would probably have a little bit more better control and I could do selective cuts in the area of calcification and debulking, thereby causing less trauma to the other side. I mean, like there is no head-to-head -head comparison, so I might be wrong or you, whatever it might be. But I guess whatever is available, we could use a directional. The other option, I don't know what PK would say, is how would a shockwave, which is a newer technology coming in, would play a role in cases like this, which, uh, where they show that the degree of dissection and the patency rate is very good. So you're right. Anything available is there. Anything you are good with, of course. And uh, PK, do you, do you think IVOS would play a role here to know how much degree of calcification and everything? I know. You know, angiogram is a two-dimensional image. I don't know if uh, <laughs> Ivos would give us a better idea of what kind of. Uh, so, so I want to. I, I we did. We uh, I totally agree with all of you. I want to show you the Ivos. Show the Ivos, please. So we do, we do. I think intravascular ultrasound is an essential tool in this particular thing to understand. This is just distal to the common femoral, and you can see as we do the Ivos pullback, you can see already you have eccentric calcium compress uh, compressing the vessel, right? So as 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 we come back. I don't know why it's kind of hanging out there. I guess we're just kind of watching. But anyway, it'll come. So as, as, as we come back. No, you have to pull the red line down. Yeah, you have to pull the red line down a little bit, please. I don't know what's happening. But anyway, oh. you'll, you'll see, as you can see on the sidebar of the IVIS over there, you can see very, very clearly that there's chunks of calcium. And to Vishal's point, it's very, very eccentric. Okay? 
And geographically, I think assessment of calcium is very, very poor. Uh, but intravascular ultrasound um, assessment of calcium is good. What do I mean by poor? You can clearly see this calcium, but you don't know if it's external calcium compressing the vessel or internal calcium. That's a popcorn type lesion. Okay. The one thing, the one thing that I think I think that's important to understand yeah. is that is that the um, uh, dependent on that, it depends on your therapy. Okay. So as you can see here, there's a, there's external calcium right there. There, see, there's a popcorn lesion. Look at the po the popcorn type growth into Love the that. vessel there. You see that with the with the calcific drop off, and you can see the the the, the shadow of the normal vessel there. So, so I think that before you choose the device, you have to identify where the calcium is. Personally, in my opinion, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you have external compressive calcium, rotational or directional atherectomy has absolutely no role, and this is only my opinion, in the treatment of this vessel because it's not going to affect the calcium outside. Over there, I think uh, a, something like a shock wave um, may, may be more util utilized in terms of being able to crack the calcium with this pulse, allowing you to expand it without dissection. My goal here is to, to do this without dissection. I don't know if I'm going to achieve it, but I do know that the only, only tools that I have to do that are, sh are possibly shockwave. The data is still pending, Clear, uh, but clearly the stent levels were very low in their initial d disrupt uh, mm -hmm. trial. Second one would be, uh, would be directional anthrectomy. Third, uh, which has clearly shown in every single trial uh, that, that for both for eccentric lesions and for prevention of, uh, of uh, flow limiting dissection <coughs> necessitating stent placement, it seems to be the way to go. Third is a pathway which in our hands has done, in, not pathway, jet stream atherectomy, which in our hands has done incredibly, incredibly well and also can be used here. My, my re rationale for using uh, directional atherectomy in this case is one, IVUS location of calcium, two, uh, the vessel size that I'm going to treat, I know with Jetstream, I'm not going to get above a 3-4 lumen, and you can talk about all the different things that Jetstream does. Uh, it does not give me a, a lumen above 3-4 unless I, I, I use balloon. With, with directional atherectomy, I have, I have better luminal gain, and, f and finally, I have directionality. I can direct this, this particular catheter towards, towards the calcium based on my angiogram. So, so I, think, I think that what we're going to do is we're going to start with directional atherectomy, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to try to see what, 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 the, what the definitive therapy should be. You know, PK, just, uh, you know, I, I, know, I, I know that you don't use uh, Phoenix that much, but Phoenix 7 French device has IVUS along with uh, directional atherectomy, right? Mm hmm So that might be a good, uh, that might be a good device also here. I don't know, if, I don't think we have that in our, in our lab. We don't use that much. No, we have it. We have everything, thank God. I, mean, I always thank Dr. Sharma for that because we do have everything. Can you give me a DSA? We do have everything. But, uh, I mean, to me, I think, I think I, I'm looking for a lumen. I mean, yes, I, I, I really think a lumen is what I want here, and I think this is going to give me the best lumen possible. Mm. So you see, so, so when you look at this, the, the question is where is the calcium, right? And right. So, so here it looks like it's lateral. Let's go in the... But, ba but based on your IVUS, it looks like it's more posterior. But I, thi right? I think with the IVUS, I don't think you, you can tell which direction it is. So that's the point here. So it looks, yeah, here it looks, I mean, here it's very, very hard to tell which side this calcium is going to be. So I'm going to have to do it by feel and then decide. I like that angiogram that we had before. That, that I think this is the most clear way yeah. of telling where the calcium is. I think if I can point the cutter, uh, you know, here. Posteriorly. Yeah, and just point it towards the calcium and see whether or not I have a good, good, uh, a, a, you know, uh, a budding of the cutter head against the calcium. I think I will be able to make the best dent. So I'm going to work on this view. Go to three scene minuses, please. So I, I want you to see what what uh, what Vishal and I did was we pulled the catheter back. So when you uh, when you use uh, directional atherectomy, minus one more. When we use directional atherectomy, it's very important to allow for the jog of the directional atherectomy catheter to go ahead and abut, abut against the calcium. So if you look at a directional atherectomy catheter, uh, is most of you, I don't know how many of you have seen a Silverhawk, you basically, can you open a Silverhawk demonstration device so we can show them? Uh, you, 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 you will see that there's a jog of the vessel that Ray will show you, and that jog of the vessel has to be allowed to actually abut against the vessel wall. If that does not abut against the vessel wall and the jog doesn't abut, then uh, just open one. Th then what happens is you will see that, 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 that you will not have a lumen. So the luminal gain is based on your ability to butt the cutter against the vessel wall. So Ray's just going to show you 
while, while uh, b- this particular jog uh, that we're talking about. And when you see this jog, you'll understand, uh, you know, uh, you know, you'll understand why it's important to pull that sheath back. Because if the, if the device is uh, enclosed within the sheath, uh, can you give them a, 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 a drive too, please? Well, if the device is in, in, uh, 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 enclosed within the sheath, then the, dr- the device is not going to be allowed to, to, uh, to you know, do the jog, which, I, which you'll see in a second. So, so this is important. So you can see uh, the catheter that Ray's holding. You open the same device that I, I open or a different one? No, different. Oh, my goodness. <coughs> you need to open a big one, guys, to show the jog. Forget it, forget it. Let me take this off. I was just trying to save time. That's not going to demonstrate anything. Yeah, okay, so, so you see this? This is the jog. You see this? So, so you, you, you see the curve of the catheter? Right. So, so when, when, uh, when you open yep. it, you, you, you see how it goes up and the cutter abuts. So this curve is important for you to allow the catheter to make this, this primary, let's call this a primary curve. And then when I turn it on, see now it's off right now. When I turn it on, see how it sits up? So the more pressure you have here, the more it's going to deflect up and going to abut up against the vessel wall. So, you know, you know I've seen guys and gals uh, go ahead and run the directional atherectomy catheter and say, oh, I got no result. Well, the reason is you don't allow the directional atherectomy catheter to, to do the work that, that it should be doing. Call down to that, please, just in case we need to go below the knee or something. So, so I think that's very, very important to understand the jog. Um, PK. Yes. The question is, um, you have, um, for people who don't know, I'm just asking this question, but the Silver Hawk has two kinds of device, right? One is LS and one is LXC, right? The new Hawk one has two, one a calcium cutter and one a regular cutter, right? Yep. Well, standard so you're going to use the sta- you're going to use a standard cutter or a significant calcium cutter. I know the calcium cutter LXC, which they say I think is more aggressive, right? You're going to use that the ho- device. The Hawk one. Yeah. So yeah. the 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 Ray knows much more about this than I do, um, and the, and and the the Hawk one is a is a is a calcium cutter uh, first line because of the improved motor. Right. Uh, can you give me a roadmap? Yeah, uh, it's it's you on. You just have to. No, oh, it's already on. Yeah, you I did it actually went on and off. So sorry about that. Got in oh, okay. So I think I think that uh, this particular one works as just uh, the calcium cutter on its own. So you can see here now it's important, you know, that uh, w- w- one of the things that uh, we always tease Vishal about is he doesn't give a good rail and he pulls the wire out. <laughs> but but uh, you know he blames me all Vishal the time. Vishal, just by make the way. sure the wire is not under he, PK's feet. He, he <laughs> always he always <laughs> makes fun of me and p- picks on me. But the truth is, all jokes aside. I think that's very important, okay? So you can see how tight this is. The silver hawk is not going. You see that? You see, so it's very important to dot this through very, very slowly, and I can already feel the grit. Now, I'm not going to cut in this direction. Unfortunately, right. at this stage, I don't know where this is. I think it's this way, just because the way I'm having the resistance. But I'm going to turn it the other side. I'm going to ask Vishal to torque it very slowly. And you can see as it torques very slowly, you can see the primary jog is going to allow the, the cutter head to go ahead and abut the, uh, the vessel wall. Okay, good. So now I think we're going to do this sort of not really in a lateral, but more like in an anterior posture. I'm going to see if I can feel the calcium, right see how it deflected. Yeah. Right. So it's yeah. not as easy as it looks. You know? So I think one of the things you have to do is, is, is get the, the tension off the, off the silver hawk. I'm sorry, I'm just moving here. And, and you can yeah. see that as you go down, it's important to understand that it's going to move and you might have to pinch the device. So yeah. I'm just going to I'm just going to hold it here. It's not moving. So let's see now. See? It's getting stuck and there it is. See see how it moved off the vessel there? Right. So I think what we're going to have to do is be very careful uh, to to see whether we can um, keep the system straight. Also keeping the system straight helps a little bit as well. So let me see whether I can just move this down slowly. Up, oh, it doesn't want to go. So this is going to be very difficult for us to do. A silver hawk in this case, I think. I you think, think uh, using a pa- uh, um, um, jet stream yes, would stream. probably help us here? Okay. I mean, in the, the assumption would be, to me, I mean, I think here the, uh, the additional cost of opening a jet stream, to me, is justified because I definitely don't want this to dissect. Right. Um, and I think that with the silver hawk doing this kind of funny business. I know it's, a, I know uh, it's an example. I'm, I'm going to get a little bit yeah. closer. Yeah. I'm going to go a little bit closer here. The and then see whether the I can just get it, get the cutter on and see whether it goes through. There it goes. Okay. So I'm just going to keep it a little close. Hold on. we make it medial again. Mm-hmm. You know, in the IVUS, it looks like that's one spot is pretty significantly uh, compressed because of the calcification. Turn it on, buddy. I think it comes oh. into the vessel. Oh. Off. Mm. <coughs> it's not going to be easy. You know what? Get, the, get me the jet stream ready. 
Problem is I don't want to dissect with the hawk and then try to use the jet stream. Yeah, right? that's right. I would not do PK because of that, uh, because it's... Um, there. Hold on, buddy. Yeah. Turn it on. There you go. See how it's just getting off. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with the jet stream here. Get the jet stream. We can do this. And the nice thing is we use the uh, Abbott wire here, which allows yeah. us to go ahead and do do the... Uh, Jet stream. Yeah, do I mean, it on the jet stream. Jet stream, yeah. I mean, yeah. jet stream takes uh, almost any. The other thing you could do is just make a little, little, um, um, <laughs> what is it called? A little balloon, but I, I don't want to use a balloon here. So give me the two, four, three, four guys. Yeah, so be. this is part of the problem. You know, with current imaging techniques, it's very, very difficult for you to understand what's going to work really, really well in, the, in these lesion subsets. But I think that's one of the technical issues with the, with the, with the, uh, with the directional atherectomy. Uh, is the problem is that it's a bulky <coughs> device and it tends to rotate on itself. But again, if this is external calcium, I think clearly then you, you, neither of these devices are going to help. So, so the jet stream uh, device is uh, made by, uh, uh, I think, Boston Scientific. And you can see here that, that, that you have a, a 2434 burr. And the 2434 burr will allow this, uh, this to just slowly grind and, and open this up. Now, Embolism is going to occur regardless of what device you decide to use. So it's very, very important to be cognizant of that. The nice thing about this jet stream device is that it allows for differential cu cutting. And differential cutting will hopefully not injure like we were trying to direct the, w the hawk away from uh, the, um, the, uh, the healthy <coughs> tissue. With the jet stream, you're, you're not going to have any involvement of the, uh, of the healthy tissue with it. So and this is the 2434 four device right. we're going to go with. And we're going to go. It comes in two modes, blades down and blades up. Blades down is a 2-4 uh, device. Blades up is a 3-4 device. And when we go up, Vishal and I will mag up and we'll show you uh, how it looks in both different modes. Now, there is always a chance of perforation with any sort of calcific lesion that you decide to do. So it's very, very important for you to always understand, uh, have a balloon open. Liz always has a, a, a 7-0 balloon ready for me, waiting to open if, if anything happens. And she usually chooses a 7 uh, balloon and just has it ready uh, you know, or a 7020 balloon, yeah. but generally a 40 works well. So she'll choose either an Armada 7040 or whatever balloon and just have it ready. And you can tell she's so prepared already. Now, 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 now the, other, the other thing is uh, you also, as far as coverage setting is concerned, I think doing it on heparin helps because you know that you, when you have bivalve rudin, that there is no real uh, uh, ability to turn off the bivalve rudin. You have to wait 30 minutes for it to wash out of the system, so on and oh. so forth. So, so, so we generally do, do iliacs and anything of, uh, you know, around the inguinal lig ligament or above, we go ahead and, and use, uh, use, uh, use uh, 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 heparin. So the ACT, the last ACT was around 261. And, we, and, and uh, we're going to check another ACT now before we go forward with this while they're setting up the, uh, this You know, PK, so the ad advantage of using uh, uh, jet stream in this kind of uh, lesions, calcified lesions is it also, not only does differential cutting, it also has aspiration at the same time, right? Yeah, but you know, I think that's a lot of bogosity. <coughs> you know, I, I, th I think the aspiration, I mean, I've used uh, lots, a lot of jet stream and I think, you know, the whole aspiration stuff is all a lot of marketing. It does aspirate mm. to a degree, but there's no way that, that, you, that you can aspirate enough to not use a filter. I know, I think so you know, long segments, it's probably um, not very useful, but small focal segments like this, I think you No, can, I, I, no? I, I disagree. I don't know what Vishal thinks. I think here the aspiration is of no value. It's very calcific. And I think that, that you're going to embolize trunks. I think what your, your, your point of, of allowing uh, you know, shorter runs is very, very important. I right. agree with that. Agree with and that. I, yeah. also, I, I think also your, your speed of advancement of the device is very, very important. But I don't believe in the aspiration. I've seen the, the, the videos of them putting it in a tube and aspirating. But unfortunately, this ain't no tube, you know? So I, I think it's very, very important for, for that, uh, th that perspective. There's a bubble. So part of that is all, it's a little cumbersome to set up compared to the Silver Hawk. Obviously, you, yeah. need, uh, you need to you know, withdraw, yeah. make sure there's no bubbles and all this. So it, it takes a little bit longer. <laughs> but let's see, but once we're up and over, um, you know, now the only problem is I pulled my sheet back, so I have to take my sheet a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. So let me just do that. You can now. always put the device and roll it over the device, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could. But uh, off road, let's, yeah, over one four wire, you want to put a seven front sheet down? Is well, it should be okay. I'm just going to give a little dye to see how that <coughs> iliac looks. A little dye, guys. Yeah. And just show me. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's going to be fine. So just gonna take it right down to there. So we got the the vessel down. I think you know, you know, those are the tricks, like you said. 
with the seven French, you could use the, the sheet as, uh, as the way, uh, as, I mean, okay. uh, the device as your rail. So uh, while Damien is preparing, uh, let's talk a little bit about CSI. What, what are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Kapoor, on CSI and this lesion? Well, I mean, it's all about the bore size and the size of the vessel Show itself. Show me where so the wire is. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Go ahead, talk uh -huh. to me. Yeah, so uh -huh. I think the CSI device probably would not give us enough luminal gain as would the other devices do. So even though CSI works great, in my personal opinion, CSI works great most of the times in below the knee vessels, even though we use it in SFA as well. But uh, in these cases, uh, I guess it's dealer's choice, whatever you're comfortable right. I, 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 I am very strong opinionated in saying that CSI will do nothing in this case. Right. I agree with you, PK. That's awesome. I just said it politely, <laughs> but yeah, okay. I think Vishal was trying to be politically yeah. correct. No, I know, of course. Oh, I mean, yeah. uh, so Vishal, I, I, I wanted to ask Vishal a question, but I think Vishal is more stressed about catching the wire right now. Yes. Oh so my God, he needs to concentrate. Leave him alone. So, uh, PK, once you atherectomize this, right? Um, what is your next step? What did you want to do? What do you plan to do? Ah, oh, let's see how the, this turns out, right? God willing that 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 this turns out well. I think we decide. We decide. Uh, <laughs> You know what are the next steps? PK, here you would cross the device, cross the cross the ca across the device, yeah. across the lesion, or I, I don't think it matters as right. much because it's a rotational device, and we and it generally has don't. And differential cutting, anyways. You okay. know, we generally don't. So I'm going to just start right here, um, and go go for it. Ready? Oh, one second. There you go. Thank you. Right. You just need to take the tension off the device. You want to, you want to pop and see? Okay. A little puffer. So very smooth, and I think this is going to be the issue here. Off. So I, I, I think one of the things that you can do is you can allow for this device to make a little bit longer run because it's a short distance that you're running. It's just the pace of how you interact with the calcium that's important. PK, my understanding, just for the sake of audience, you, you went blades down first. Yeah, right? that's what, yep, now we're going blades so up. So you're, you're right in the lesion, you, do you pull back to yeah, a normal vessel and then go We pull back blades. right there, on please. On. Blades up. And now blades your up. blades up, right? I can see the blades, right? So that, uh, you know, can we mag up a little bit so that they can see the blades up? Okay. <laughs> Vishal, do you want to, uh, PK, you want to just pull it back, show them blades down and blades up, how it looks? Yeah. I wouldn't bother. You can see here, it's decelerating, and I think that deceleration that's, that's is very is, important. Right? Okay, Rex, Rex. Como esta? Todo bien, Rex? So you have the Rex now, the Rex mode? No, Rex. You don't have to take it out. No. No? I want to make one more run. So Rex mode. Uh, which allows just to clear the inner suctional lumen. Right. <coughs> <coughs> when uh, the the person who worked incredibly hard on this was uh, was Ted, uh, when he was with the old uh, Pathway company, and Ted and I did the first cases with Dr. Right. Zeller. You can walk it back. Walk with back. Dr. Zeller, uh, just actually I'll come back. And I think one of the things that we learned very quickly oh, was yeah. that the device has come to so many different iterations. That, that the central channel blades up blades doesn't up. get clogged you think, anymore. I, I think um, you're right in the calcified lesion. You want to pull back a little bit and then go. <laughs> well, Dyra. Take it just a thought. If you if you, if you if Walk you get the if Show you get the sheet one? a little bit more closer, uh -huh. you think you'll get more um, more kind of contact with the uh, with the calcified lesion? Unfortunately, no, because I got to be honest with you, it, it doesn't make a difference okay. what it is, right? The filter. So yeah, filter is migrated because it, mm -hmm. it vibrates and that that happens. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't pull the wire wire out and, uh, into and move the filter, you're okay. It's that's very normal because it goes over the bifurcation and it slows down. And always watch the filter when it comes out. DSA guys here of the filter. Mm -hmm. Actually, non-DSA the filter. Ready? Mm -hmm. Inject. Inject. Good. Mm -hmm. And the filter is right above our trifurcation, which yep. is kind of where we always want it. And now we're going to go ahead and take a uh, DSA, DSA shot, okay. and then we'll do an IVIS. 
And remember, we have a directional atherectomy. We may still use yeah, it. Yeah, we can still use it. That's true. I was just going to say that. So that looks like it's pretty yeah. good. A little better. We can now. Do you want now? Do you want to try a directional atherectomy device and try and see? Let's iris it. Yeah. Uh, and now, now that you have it on the table, so we can. So, Karthi, like let me ask you this: Any role of these uh, no angioscalps or any of these scoring balloons? I don't know, Vishal. I don't think so. Uh, I would not use an angioscalps or scoring. I think this degree of calcification. I don't think angioscalps or scoring balloons will give you much of a result. What do you think? No. Let's not speak a chocolate and just call any role for residual calcification. Nah. Or you just go directly with. The no, I think I think I think once you've uh, now we got the directional atherectomy catheter, we'll go with directional atherectomy catheter. Uh, you know the the problem is we had ballooned it prior to using uh, the directional atherectomy. You'll go ahead and dissect it, and so and then that'll preclude you from using anything. You tried the DCA twice, didn't go well. So you said, okay, let me l let me eat the cost and buy uh, and do the. Uh, the pathway. So the issue here is, listen, the bottom line is this, you do not want to stent this at all costs. That's my opinion. So, you know, we're just doing this uh, at this purpose. And again, it highlights some of the difficult decision making. You don't, you don't have a, a, a decision here. It's much smoother when you go through. So record, Damien. PK, they had this TICO trial, right? In 2016, I think they published it in Jack. Is that it? Yep. Yeah. Um, they had pretty significant results with pretty good results. They compared stenting versus endarterectomy, yeah. right? And the results are very, very comparable. Right, Sandeep? Is, am I right? Or Say that, which trial is it? The TICO trial. The TICO trial is the trial where they, they used it in, uh, I think, 117 patients. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the main that's studies which compared uh, common, yeah, common femoral yeah. stenting versus uh, endarterectomy. It was published in Jack in 2016, yeah. May, I think. If I'm not wrong. A little bit better. I'll have to look at it. And very, a very comparable I know result. there is one, you know, the problem with the stenting is uh, whatever case reports I could pull up is that the direction I if you have to reaccess, very high bleed risk. You know, the grind is uh, difficult. You know. Do me a favor. Why don't you scrub out and uh -huh. look up this trial? Okay. Because I don't, trial. I don't believe it was endarterectomy versus stenting. No, it was. It was PK. They compared, uh, they had 117 Tico. patients, mm -hmm. 62 Tico. patients. How, how do you spell that trial, Karthik? Tico, T-E-C-C-O. Can you hold that? Okay, let me pull it up. Road map, right? trial. It's 117 patients, 62 okay. and 63, uh, 57, I think. Uh, they had completely comparable Tico. results. Uh, the only benefit of uh, stenting was significantly less hospitalizations and morbidity really? at 30, uh, 30 day period. They looked at two year uh, mo uh, morbidity and mortality and uh, revascularization results. We can just do it because maybe the too much jog also okay. prevents it. It was published in Jack in uh, June 2016, if I'm not wrong. So one of the things that Vishal and I are going to do now is leave the sheath closer because maybe the jog was too aggressive preventing the silver hawk from actually passing. So we're going to allow the, uh, it's still pretty aggressive, see? You still have a lot of resistance to flow, to, to uh, advancing the silver you, would you would you rotate the device once and try? We're going see? to, of course, yeah. but I, I think that just, you know, either way you do it, it's just interesting how there's so much resistance to the silver hawk device going down. See there. I mean it's it goes. a bulky device, so. Well, it is bulky, but the whole idea is you also want to try to clean out this area, uh, you know, as much with the, without b before going up with a balloon. So let me just see. Okay, you were talking about shockwave, uh, shockwave device. What do you what you think you would use it here? If, uh, I think I think I think I need to know. I need to know more before I no, use no, I it, need right? To ask him. Uh, Karthik, sorry, yes. how, I'm sorry um, to bother you. What's the, how do you spell that trial again? T-E-C-C-O. Off. No, just to watch. T-E-C-C-O. Okay, I got, it. I got it. Let me go a little bit more the other way here. They did a randomized control okay. trial of it. Okay, on. Yeah, it's a, it was published in Jack, I think, uh, in 2000, uh, not yeah. 2016, 2017 yeah. May. They published. published. They presented it in uh, TCT oh. in 2016, and then the initial results, and they published it in 2017. Oh. <coughs> so I think you just got to keep chipping away here, like Vishal and I are trying to do. It's going to be. Uh, yeah. Wait, no, rotate okay. it back. It just it, it's the resistance to this device is there, so. Straight, maybe straight, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it was a, I, I don't know, I'm not sure number of patients, but I think 60, Aunt. 60 something patients. I think yeah, they compared and they compared it to an artrectomy versus stenting. They were very comparable results. Off. Yeah, I know, but okay. uh, he said. All right, give us, uh, give us the IVS again. Yeah. I just want to see. The All right, now give me um, a, a short. Um, 
chocolate balloon, 6O short chocolate balloon. You can type uh, T-E-C-C-O, capital letters, randomized control trial, CFA versus endarterectomy. You'll see it. And Jack. Yeah, I don't know if it's in. You can just put it in PubMed. You'll get it. All right, on with the IVIS, guys. Go live, please. You were able to do three cuts, right, PK? Yeah, yeah we all, well, pretty much. Vishal and I avoided the the, the healthier surgery, segment you know, of the vessel. Have to increase maze. And you can see here we got much better lumen already. Much better. That's pretty good, right, PK? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Much right better there. than before. Yeah, much better than before. There you go. Look at that. We're yeah. able to. That silver hawk. You see those classic rabbit right. ears? Right. That's the silver hawk <laughs> cuts in there. So it really scored the calcium well. I mean, I really cut the calcium well. So now we're going to go with a. A short DCB, I mean not a DCB, a short chocolate, 6040, which I think is the largest. Is there six or they have seven? They don't have seven, yeah. Can you go uh, RAO, please? PK, any, any thought about DCB versus uh, chocolate? Uh, you know, it's a calcified lesion. There's no real data with DCB. You know, uh, you know I, may, I may do it because, because, you know, I'm trying to extrapolate. At least I know I have data with atherectomy. I have data with stents. I, have, I, have, I don't have data with scoring balloons, but I have no data with DCB. So I don't know. I don't know. I think at this stage uh, we'll decide after this. Go ahead. Go ahead. Very good. So now we're going to go so up with the do? chocolate do very slowly. Again, be very cognizant of that filter. It's going to be full. You know, you have to trust the people. No, no, temo ever, senor. I just want to see the curve. Trust you the know, people. Like, uh, we'll take care of the filter. Yeah, yep, to take care <laughs> of the filter. Sandeep, you were able to find it? Yeah, we did, uh, Karthik. I'm okay. just oh, looking oh. at, uh, you know, their 24-month uh, Kaplan markers. Give me one second. Okay, wait. Why don't you summarize it after you, you read it yeah. over? Okay. <coughs> and also, Sandeep, you can look oh at a no. paper published from Italy, I think in Euro Interventions, 2017. Mm -hmm. They compared atherectomy for severely calcified lesions, DCB versus uh, mm -hmm. non-DCB. Um, atherectomy Give with DCB. Give me one DCB. second, Karthik. Yeah. Even that was a good paper uh, for CFA. Six. Six, seven, they, they looked at uh, about uh, uh, 37 patients, PK. Well, I, again, you know, yeah. it's, it's such a, it's such small yeah, numbers. Yeah, I know it's small studies, but you know, again, finding CFA I mean, lesions. And the follow-up is uh, what for a Claudican, <coughs> you know, uh, you know, it, it, anything <laughs> short of five years is really not right. something that we can we can we can really brace our practice right. on. Right. You know, I think I think it's very very important. ACT, please. <coughs> so we're gonna go ahead and just uh, balloon angioplasty this a little bit. And we're going to, I think the other part that I want to just uh, stress to our audience is the technique of balloon angioplasty. You can see here that mm -hmm. Vishal uh, has been a long-time proponent of leaving the balloons up. And so, you know, so have I. I think we both decided, you know, to, to fight our interventional car cardiology uh, genetics and, uh, you know, stop going up and down with the balloon. It's also the way of inflating the balloon. I think inflating the balloon slowly and deflating the balloon slowly, especially with these truly inferior peripheral balloons. I mean, it's unfortunate because the coronary balloons are so, so much more advanced in the technology, uh, the way they go up, their, their ability to, to, to cross lesions, their ability to deflate. I think with these uh, other balloons, which aren't as good, uh, unfortunately, you know, we, uh, it's important for us to understand the limitations of these balloons. However, if you use them properly, go up slowly, go down slowly, you're able to clearly uh, expand the lesion and, and uh, prevent dissection. And I think PK, don't you think the recoil rates are much higher in the peripheral vessels than in the coronary vessels itself? But I, I don't think that has anything to do with the balloon, though. I, I think the, pro the problem is the balloons, you know, they, 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 they don't rewrap properly. They, 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 they don't open properly. So, you know, if you it's a lot having to do with, uh, with the technology and the amount of uh, yeah, uh, development of the these balloons as compared the to the coroners. Yeah. As you know, Karthi, you could take a coronary balloon uh, and take it anywhere, pretty much even in the periphery. So, you know, I think that it's important for that cross-pollination to our IR colleagues and our, our VS colleagues to be able to do it. So, Vishal is looking at it. It's one, one minute, so 30 PK, seconds. Just, to, leave it just at three for minutes. the sake of audience, chocolate is a balloon wrapped in a nitinol gauze, right? It's a nitinol yes. box, yeah. Yes. So, it's basically like a nitinol, nitinol gauze right around the balloon so you can have controlled balloon inflations, right? 
Well, it, the idea of a chocolate is that, is that you can, it's restrained within the cage that doesn't allow the balloon to differentially expand in different areas. So what it allows for it to do is they call it these pillows, and what these pillows do will go up and prevent the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the dissections. It's incredible marketing, it really is. But however, Tony Das, our good friend, has done a wonderful study uh, in chocolate below the knee, and our other good friend, Medi, Medi uh, out of Cleveland uh, Hospitals, is now going to go on the DCB chocolate, uh, uh, chocolate coated DCB called the Chocolate Bar Study, which he's been kind enough to include us in. So, uh, so I think that you know, there is a lot of technology here uh, in terms of, of all jokes aside, in terms of preventing dissection and, and in preventing uniform expansion, I mean, in promoting uniform oh expansion. So I think that uh, these, these nitinol wrapped cages really prevent the balloon from, from expanding in compliant areas more than in, uh, in uh, non-compliant areas, you know, so it's really even expansion. Okay, so, so now that uh, Sandeep has, has uh, read through the trial, he's going to tell us what it was. So, you know, briefly, it's a French trial, uh, 117 patients, uh, equally divided between uh, surgical revascularization versus uh, stenting for uh, common femoral uh, uh, stenosis. And, uh, you know, the primary endpoint was 30-day uh, events. And as expected, you know, surgery was associated with the uh, more complications, wound infections, bleeding, perforation, uh, and uh, wound infections and hospital stay. But what's interesting is, and which is kind of in line with, you know, uh, the large uh, registry from Dr. Zeller's group and uh, from yes Dr. Sir. Mehta's group in the uh, U.S. Yes the potency at 24 months was comparative between uh, uh, endotrectomy and uh, stenting group. But, you yeah. know, again, to uh, what Dr. Krishnan mentioned is, you know, once you put a stent in CFA, you are losing the holy grail to all the vascular procedures. You know, these are patients, elderly Seven patients. Oh they're going to need, oh Seven they're gonna need Seven access oh for their uh, cardio cardiac procedures. 740 impact. Any vascular procedures. They always any have radials, Sandeep. Well, you know, for all the large bore access and everything, I would still avoid a stent, honestly. You know, that would be my take on it. Well, you know, Until I unless I have to so do uh, it. So I'm sorry. What was the what was the end point? So basically, at 24 months, you know, the primary oh yes. potency and TLRs were similar, about 80 percent. Completely 80 comparable, PK, yeah. to, uh, to both. But they have but more mor morbidity and mortality rates for the surgery. Uh, no, surgery, no, which is the first 30 years. 30 day. They I had uh, yeah. uh, on average they had five to six hospitalization days um, for for surgery, and they had uh, 24 to 48 hours for stenting. I think I, I think it highlights the um, the the controversies that exist in this particular section. So I think, I think it, it, it makes sense here to, to be prudent in, uh, in making a decision as a multidisciplinary team, talking to your team members and then deciding what's the best thing to do. And I think uh, you know, this is a, a very good discussion beyond just doing the case. I think it's a very, very good discussion. And I think in the paper, having. I think they used only regular yep. BMS stents, if I'm not yeah, wrong. Yeah, nitinol stents. Nitinol no stents, and yep. they didn't use nitinol any stents. superas. No superas were used, no DCBs were used. Well, I, yeah. I don't know if yeah. this is really a good territory yeah. for a supera because I think with the, uh, with the elongation p potential and things like that, mm -hmm. I don't think this is a good area for a supera anyway. Give me a little die, guys. Yeah. Yeah. PK, if you have to use a stent in this zone, what kind of stent would you use? Mm -hmm. Huh? What kind of stent would you use if you have to use a stent? If I have to use a stent, um, I wouldn't use a stent. Go up. <laughs> Vishal, if you have to use a stent, what would you use? I'll use a self-expanding nitinol bare metal stent. Bare metal stent. All right. Uh, why, I mean, why not silver? You know, uh, I know we already use a drug coated. Why? If we are putting out the framework is the same, you know, the, uh, the framework of the stent is same. Why not give women more durability, at least the theoretical benefit? What's That's reasonable. So slowly. Yeah. Yeah. If I had to use a stent, I would use a supera here. Supera? Yeah. Oh. And if we have to re-access the groin, then what? Uh, you can still access through the supera. Yeah. With the large? Oh. If you have to, but la not large bore so though. Again, okay. large bore you still have. Uh, you still have the other groin. So. <coughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. I know, but P P PK said he would never use a stent. So that I, said, okay. I would not use a stent. I I would call my colleagues in surgery and say, hey, listen, this is what happened. We tried our best after having a long discussion with you. And, uh, and uh, the, can you just do a common femoral endotrectomy right now? 
I don't think putting a stent there is the a lot right of thing. surgeons now can do common femoral arteriectomy with just local uh, local anesthesia. Because there is no uh, reason. There yeah. is absolutely no reason to put right. a stent here. It is so easily accessible uh, completely with agreeable. an incision, yes. and there is absolutely no reason. I mean, okay. if if he's a, so such a bad surgical candidate, then I would agree with uh, I would agree with Sandeep. I would use the silver PTX here. Reasonable. Or I would use agree with Vishal, and I would use a a bare metal self-expanding if I've already done uh, drug-coated uh, balloon. So, you know, the only argument that, that you could make is that, uh, you know, the Zilver PTX double drug, you know, may not be the best, but uh, so therefore, actually we don't know. Actually, I shouldn't say it may not be the best. We really don't know what that result is. So anyway, so we're giving this patient all the benefits here. Obviously, there's this, uh, PK, no, study with, uh, no study with uh, DCB followed, uh, atherectomy followed by DCB in calcified lesions. We know Krishna is running the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, what is it called, reality, reality yeah. study, which we're, again, we're very fortunate in participating in. But again, it's not in this particular zone. Specific. But clearly, it's extrapolated data from definitive AR, which showed that calcified lesions in this area made, uh, may have had some additional benefit uh, with atherectomy and DCB. So, you know, I think this is a, a good practice. I think it's contemporary practice to follow up um, uh, uh, when you're, uh, these lesions uh, with the DCB when you're not planning on stenting. PK, what balloon is this? This is the Impact SFA 7040 balloon. We, choose, we chose a larger balloon to get the maximum luminal gain that we possibly can. Plus we had IVIS measurements that were saying it was around 6.5 or so. So we went ahead and did a, a 70 impact. Uh, we're leaving it up for our usual three, three and a half minutes, coming down slowly and then taking a picture. Now, Karthik, there, uh, even if there's a dissection, I am not going to stent it unless, <coughs> unless there's flow limitation. Right. That's, uh, that's, I think that's the rule that <coughs> we all have to think about. That's the golden rule of common femoral anyways, right? So you, you, don't have to st you don't have to stent it unless it's, there's a perf flow. Right. Yes. <coughs> Let's see how this looks. And then we'll do another IVIS, okay. and then we'll be done with it. Problem is you have really no endpoints here. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things we could look at is a gradient, uh, see whether we have a gradient. But I think, I think uh, you know, our endpoint to intervention will be a, a ultrasound peak systolic velocity, you know? All right. So I think we'll, we'll get the ultrasound tomorrow uh, and see how he feels. But I think, I think that we've achieved a good result uh, with just this. So Vishal brought the balloon down, and it's now uh, just a little bit short of three minutes, and uh, we're yeah, going to let the balloon completely, oh, he said we're ahead of that. So yeah, we're going to just completely let it de deflate and come back slowly because the wire is close to the filter. And, uh, and you get a little bit of resistance. It's a bulky balloon, and it's an 014 wire, so naturally we have some issues. So we're just going to get off. And now we're going to do a quick DSA picture. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's do let's do a, yeah let's do a picture and then an IVIS. Okay. Right mm -hmm. yeah. Very nice. Very nice. That's pretty. Re that's that's pretty, pretty good. good. That's pretty let's good get the IVIS, what please. We started off with for sure. What oh, is he saying? Are we finished? We're done. He's finished. Yeah, cinco minutos. Would you take a, a, a lateral picture like you did? Uh, I will. Just to see? Yeah. Yeah. I will. I definitely will. <coughs> so the linear yeah, dissections the you see, uh, oh, you're saying oh, that will heal with DCB, point. right, PK? I think I think 100% oh, this mm -hmm. is going to heal. I mean, uh, right. in our experience, this is healed uh, in the SFA. We don't stent dissections like this in the SFA. I don't see why this would be any different. As far as antiplatelet therapy, we'd put him on three months of aspirin and Plavix. Right. Um, and then follow him. We'll get ultrasounds, and then we'll do this. So here we are in the SFA. That's the area we saw before on. So you can see here, I'm going to pull back slowly. Record, Record guys. Okay. We're recording. And you can see it's very good so far. And I'm coming closer and closer to the common femoral. There's our bifurcation That's we just crossed. Now we are in the common femoral. Mm -hmm. Much better luminal gain. Oh, yeah. Much better. Much better luminal gain. Yeah. I, and you see the dissection is actually not in the vessel. <laughs> right. It's outside. It's so you're okay. Right. You're yeah. okay. Yeah. You are okay. You got a nice lumen. Obviously, stenting would make it better. 
I think we're done. All right. So what happened is when you stretched the vessel, you actually tore uh, the, the adventitia is what it looks like. I, I, it doesn't look like a lot of right. uh, interval disruption. Right. So now I'm just going to go do another Even angiographically, view. it looks more like adventitial yeah, uh, let's D see. anyway. So. Yep, DSA. Hold on. See, you can see it's yeah. not really a, a bad dissection by any means. Yep. Right. So it yeah. definitely it definitely looks a little bit better. Again, don't hope for that complete removal of the calcium. You're not going to have that. Well, now let's go to low mag here. Yeah. Look at the flow. Make sure we didn't cause any any dissections or anything bad with the wire. And I think part of that is I'm just going to open the shutters. Oh, I thought I was. Don't worry about it. Inject just to see how the flow is. You can see very good flow, yeah. you know, down the SFA. No issues. I'm going to go down below the knee. I think very important for everybody at home to follow up uh, with good images to make sure that you haven't perfed anything or haven't embolized and you have the same amount of vessels that you had pre that you have post, you know? So obviously there's a, mm -hmm. what looks like an AV fistula, which is interesting. Question is, was the wire there and did it cause that AV fistula? So we don't know. He had the similar thing before. Oh, he's had that prior. Yeah, okay. It was there so before. Okay, I, didn't, I don't remember seeing yeah. that, so that's good. <laughs> And, uh, you know, again, it's good questions to ask, right? If you do see something that you don't like remember that. seeing. So, so oh. I guess we're going to exactly one hour right. into the procedure. Right. I'm going to allow Vishal to take the shot and just kind of go over a quick <laughs> recap. I think, I think this is a very good lesion. What we'll do now is we'll go ahead and capture uh, the filter, uh, do, our, do our final shots, and then, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and send this patient uh, to the recovery area and obviously either send him home later today or tomorrow, likely tomorrow. I think, I think that you know, the follow-up for this patient is very important. We'll get a post-discharge ultrasound, I'd say at the end of one week. We'll follow him three months, six months, and a year um, uh, with ultrasounds. And uh, our, our end point of therapy would, would either be restenosis because it's a common femoral region or, or recurrence of symptoms, in which I think our, our second option now would be to ask him to have a femoral endartrectomy. Second thing, so I think that this case really illustrated a lot of the controversies that are associated with common femoral artery disease. I think Sandeep did a, a, a good presentation, albeit a little incomplete. He forgot the TICO trial. Uh, but I think, I think at the same, you know, you, you can't, you can't, you can't blame them. the fellow for yeah. everything. No, you, can't you have to. I mean, that's, right? that's, so I mean, you had all time, all, if, uh, when I was a fellow, I would have gotten beaten by Dr. I, I think he did a better but job than I did when I was a fellow. That's for sure. Nobody's arguing that. <laughs> uh, but but the, the, uh, the other thing, the other thing is that I think that the, as you see, the, the, the studies have highlighted all, all the different therapies that are available. All the different therapies that are available, and you can see that the therapies that are available, really, there's no real good randomized head-to-head -head data comparing surgery to to uh, uh, to endovascular therapy. Very clearly, I think patient selection is the key. I think you need to have a discussion with your surgeon regarding who is who is a candidate for surgical therapy, and if the patient and and the fa and the family and the surgeon and you are agreeable, surgical therapy remains the standard of care in today's day and age. If the patient or the family or, or, or the, the, the comorbidities of the patient de are deemed that this patient may be a high risk for surgery and the lesion doesn't involve the profunda, then I think endovascular therapy is a reasonable, reasonable approach to do it. The goals of endovascular therapy are, 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 uh, are luminal gain, prevention of dissection, and prevention of stenting. You saw in this particular case, we, 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 we used a filter for distal protection. Then we went ahead and did atherectomy. Rotational directional is up to you. We talked about the different points and strengths of each one in this case. And matter of fact, in this case, we did both in order to be able to go ahead and get uh, the maximum luminal gain. Then we used a, a, a cutting balloon and a, um, a, um, a, a drug-coated balloon and did not have a flow-limiting dissection with, with a good luminal gain by IVIS. So I think, I think that this case highlights some technical issues as well as some discussion issues, and I think uh, it was overall well discussed. So I hope this uh, adds to your fund of knowledge regarding common femoral. Um, I look forward, I thank obviously Vishal and you, Karthik, and the entire, our team here behind the cameras and uh, our producers who are running it, and most of all, uh, you know, Sandeep from doing a great job with that presentation. So we'll see you on the 28th, and then we'll see you live uh, as we transmit uh, to link in, uh, in, a, in a next Tuesday. So thanks again. All right, everyone. I think it was a great case, and uh, PK, as usual, did a fantastic job uh, and his team. Uh, Vishal, I think, is uh, always there to uh, 
put in his in input and everything, and, and I think uh, we, as a team, they do a great job. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you again on uh, February 28th as, uh, for the next live case session for the endovascular. So as PK said, uh, we have a live case um, to the link we are transmitting uh, next, uh, next Tuesday, that's the 30th of January. Um, all the previous cases and even this case uh, will be archived into the website. Uh, about a week later, you guys can go in and have a look at it. If you guys have any questions, uh, you're more than welcome to email it to us and we will respond to the questions. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for joining us uh, and a happy new year.